Nowadays, thanks to technology, research is even more productive. Evidence of rainforest growth in Antarctica was obtained from a core sample of sediment deposit taken from the seabed near the 90 million year old Sosnovy Ostrov glacier. During the first stage, the team discovered a fascinating dense network of roots that spread throughout the entire layer of soil, which was so well preserved that not only could countless traces of pollen, spores and the remains of flowering plants be seen, but even individual cell structures could be distinguished. New evidence has shown that the ancient polar landscape wasn't merely comprised of temperate forests, but temperate tropical rainforests. This means that the climate of the present ice-cold continent was not just temperate then, but substantially warmer than had previously been assumed. Antarctica was a completely different world. It was alive and flourishing in every sense. In addition to the dense and rich vegetation, here various animals, herbivores, omnivores and carnivores could be found. Among them were also arboreal forms of animals by all appearances, the same as Marumbiotherium glacialis, a small marsupial, something resembling a mouse or a possum. Perhaps small sloths that looked very similar to modern-day ones could be encountered on the branches. Among land animals, the most numerous were representatives of the Sparnotheriodontidae family of mammals a group of extinct South American ungulates, or hoofed mammals, that somewhat resembled horses. Judging by the structure of the teeth, they were herbivores and reached a body mass of up to 400 kilograms. Also on land, one could come across flightless or cursorial birds, one was ostrich-like and the other carnivorous and probably quite dangerous. Along the shores of the ancient Antarctic Peninsula, one might run into king-sized penguins and in the sky falconiforms, falcons and caracaras. In the lakes, temnospodnils waited for prey. They were giant crocodile-like amphibians. For example, Antarctosicus polidon. Reptiles of all kinds roamed the land. Impressive, massive predators. A small lizard-like insectivore, Prolacerta, and of course, dinosaurs. It was not just a Jurassic Park, but a whole continent. The most exotic of them was the Cryolophosaurus aliotti, the ice crest lizard, the narrow skull measuring 65 centimeters, with a huge mouth studded with sharp teeth, could have swallowed a slow-moving person, if of course there had been any at that time. He lived on the dry land about 200 million years ago as did many others when Antarctica was free of ice. Another interesting creature was the glacialisaurs, a sauropodomorph, and distant relative of the famous giant long-necked sauropods. However, the glacialisaurs was much more modest in size. In all likelihood, it averaged 7.6 meters in length, besides weighing significantly less, 4 to 7 tons, which permitted it to rise briefly on two legs. Who would have thought that 90 million years ago, near the South Pole, the average air temperature in the summer was 19 degrees Celsius, that it was a tropical, green world, rich in flora and fauna. Now these are cold lands, similar to Mars. So what happened? What sort of climatic occurrence could have prompted such global changes? A giant meteorite, maybe a great worldwide flood, or perhaps the expansion of the Tasman Strait between Antarctica and Australia, which in previous geological epochs formed the single continent. No matter whatever happened, the thriving world came to an end. A new era had arrived, the era of the Ice Ages. And as it seems, after millions of years, this is normal for planets of the same type as the Earth. Who knows what cold worlds hundreds of light years away from us are hiding under a thick layer of ice.
our gaze falls upon the newly born sun surrounded by protoplanetary dust. Let's fast forward the ribbon of time a little. We catch sight of billions of rocks circling around the sun, which are being attracted together by means of accretion. Millions of years pass, and these rocks have become planets orbiting the sun. 4,540 million years ago, our home, our planet, comes into existence. From this moment, the primeval stage of life in Earth's history begins. 3,800 million years ago, the Earth is completely covered with water. But if you zoom in on it, you can see tiny islands. This is molten rock. Volcanoes are breaking through the ocean. Over time, this lava will cool, forming volcanic islands. They will later merge to form the first continents. 3,500 million years ago, if we look at the shallow watered areas of the ocean, we will see something like stones under the water. In fact, these are cyanobacterial communities, which are conglomerations or mats of living bacteria. The remains of these mats are called stromatolites. About 540 million years ago, the time of visible life or the Phanerozoic Eon began and continues to this day. It is known as both a period of the rapid development of species as well as a period of their massive extinction. And what, you may ask, was happening to the Earth during this time? At the beginning of the Paleozoic era, sections of dry land joined together into a huge supercontinent located in the southern hemisphere with an area of more than 100 million square kilometers. It united Africa, South America, Antarctica, Australia, New Zealand and some other territories. In the same manner, there were other continents in the equatorial zone, plus small islands. Approximately 440 million years ago, these continents were still devoid of life. The land areas were slowly covered merely by simple mosses and lichens. But in the waters of the oceans, seaweed, mollusks and arthropods developed. At the beginning of the Silurian period, in the equatorial zone, in areas near the water, the first plants began to appear and the formation of lung tissue and arthropods is observed. Next came the Devonian period, approximately 418 to 353 million years ago. This period is marked by the development of forest, tree-like ferns begin to thrive. Large expanses of water are already filled with representatives of species that have bone and cartilage, as well as amphibians, which could also live on dry land. At this time, somehow or other, all manner of insects appeared, the numbers of which are currently countless. The Permian Geologic Period, or 290 to 248 million years ago, at last, the development of reptiles is observed and what's known as the therapsids, which turn out to be the ancestors of mammals. Due to the still high temperatures, deserts have appeared on the surface, but ferns and conifers were also able to survive amidst them. The Permian period ended with the most massive extinction since multicellular life began and the causes proposed for it are extremely diverse. One of the most common and most likely is an asteroid striking the planet, which activated a large number of volcanoes. Eruptions of ash and emissions of sulfur dioxide from their throats are capable of reaching the stratosphere and blocking the sunlight. As a result, a long volcanic winter contributed to the mass extinction. However, following the tragedy, the Triassic period, by now a part of the Miocenic era, quickly compensated for the losses and more than that, brought life up to a new level. For the first time in the history of the Earth, the temperate latitudes became overgrown with forests. A transformation also occurred in the seas and oceans, the spread of blue-green algae, a diversity of fish, mollusks and arthropods, and their migration into the deeper underwater layers. The world's oceans and seas began to acquire their current appearance. The Mesozoic era lasted from 250 to 66 million years ago. It consisted of three periods, the Triassic, the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. Indeed, it was at this time 
that one of the most popular ancient animals ever lived, the dinosaurs. Flowering plants and the progenitors of birds begin to appear, and the land begins to divide into continents. By the end of the Cretaceous period, the Earth was already looking similar to nowadays. Flowering plants became the dominant group of plants. Whether because of that or not, the development of higher mammals and real birds was happening actively. To the present day, the true cause of the extinction of the dinosaurs is still unknown. A huge asteroid, global cooling and other reasons have been named as the culprits. Whatever the case, the giant lizards disappeared, paving the way for the further development of mammals. Eventually, evolution or creation led to the emergence of a unique species, Homo sapiens, you and me. To be precise, we live in the Cenozoic era, in the Quaternary period. The precise way that life developed is without a doubt very important and valuable to us. It can be said that our life is the result of everything that has happened to the Earth and upon it. And the current era, let's hope, is the next stage in its development and evolution towards better and more developed life. It is important to know, to understand and to appreciate the past and to think about our activity these days. After all, it directly affects the future of the entire planet. The oceans that cover most of the Earth's surface are invisible territories teeming with life. Far beneath the waves, where no sunlight penetrates, is the twilight zone, a world devoid of light. We offer to dive with us today into the mysteries of our planet, revealing some of the secrets of the twilight zone of the deep sea world. Twilight zone of the ocean, or as it is called, dysphotic zone is the middle layer of ocean waters, which extends to a depth of 200 meters to two kilometers, which extends to a depth of 200 meters to two kilometers. Near the upper boundary of this area, primary production through photosynthesis is no longer possible. And at depths below this zone, light from the surface practically does not penetrate, which creates an atmosphere that is not rosy. However, Despite the lack of light, life is abundant in this zone, although different from that found in the higher or lower layers of the ocean. It is home to a variety of marine organisms whose life activities have a major impact on the global carbon cycle and thus on important climate processes across the planet. 
One of the key mechanisms in carbon transport may be the daily vertical migration of mesopelagic animals from the twilight zone to the surface and back. That is, they spend the day at depth, hiding from predators, and at night, under the cover of darkness, rise to the surface for nutrients. This behavior leads to the transfer of part of the carbon absorbed by them with food to greater depths together with the products of life. It is thought that the biomass of fish living in the mesopelagic zone may be 100 times greater than the total biomass of all fish caught annually in the world. For example, lanternfish, of which there are about 250 species, are not only the most common fish in the twilight zone of the ocean, but also the most common vertebrates on the planet. Their huge numbers were first noticed during World War. Aye, aye, when marine sonar operators saw echoes from what appeared to be the solid sea floor rising to the surface at night and sinking back down at dawn. In fact, the sound pulses reflected off the swim bladders of billions of lanternfish as they congregated in dense layers, hiding at depth. Their daily swimming, up and down, formed vital links between the surface and the deep. Of course, one of the characteristic inhabitants of the twilight zone are bioluminescent organisms. But why there? The fact is that because of the scant penetration of sunlight, many inhabitants of this world have learned to emit light through the process of bioluminescence. It is believed that up to 90s of living organisms living in this zone are able to emit their own light, like deep sea light bulbs. For example, the dragonfish, which inhabits a wide range of depths of thousands of meters, has a large head and a mouth equipped with many sharp fang-like werewolf teeth. These have a long filamentous structure known as antennae with a light forming photophoter at the tip attached to the chin. A certain species of dragonfish cannot glow for longer than 30 minutes without adrenaline. However, in the presence of adrenaline, it can emit light for hours. Incidentally, they emit a blue-green light whose wavelength can travel the farthest in the ocean. But further interesting, in front of you is Lampoctea's cruentiventer, a species of combfish whose body is colored dark red in order to blend in with its surroundings. The dark red color masks the bioluminescence of the organisms. It eats and hides it from potential predators, like all representatives of the type. They move with the help of movement of plates, consisting of cilia. There are survival defense mechanisms for the hatchet fish, too. The size of this fish does not exceed 10 centimeters. At the same time, its eyes are quite large, looking upward and also telescopic. All species of fish that are included in this family have photophores, which are located on the lower half of the body in groups of several pieces. The arrangement of photophores is such that the green light they emit is directed downward, creating what is called an anti-shadow effect. This makes the silhouette of the fish, which can be seen against the scattered light falling from above, more blurred. This is what makes the hatchet fish less visible to predators that may be below it. But the more frightening inhabitants in the twilight zone of the ocean is definitely squid. There are quite a few species. For example, the squid fly squid, only seven centimeters long, lives in the Pacific Ocean and the Sea of Japan. The body of the firefly squid is covered with many photophores up to 1101 individual. In the daylight, they look like quite ordinary squid, but in the dark comes a real transformation. The entire body of the squid begins to glow bright blue, blue light. The turn on luciferin, squid, increase the flow of oxygen, carrying blood to the photophores. However, Increasing or decreasing blood flow is a rather slow process, and squid can make their photophores flash on and off many times a second. They do this at the expense of special pigment cells, chromatophores, 
able to command the nervous system to expand almost instantly, closing the photophores, or gather in a point, again opening the luminous organ. Flickering squid live at depths of up to 600 meters, and their glow is usually only seen by sea creatures. But every spring, these squid gather for a party off the coast of Japan to attract partners. They turn all their spotlights on full blast, and the coastal waters of the bay are flooded with bright blue light. In front of you, squids from the family, Architeuthidae use a rather unusual way to hunt, as well as for defense against predators. Two long tentacles resembling clubs that are equipped with suction cups to grab prey. Extremely unrecommended encounters, and diplomacy won't work either. The squid Histiotuthis heteropsis, also known as the strawberry squid, or the poor squid. Yes, he has one interesting feature, different eyes. His left eye is twice as big, so you are unlikely to catch him reading a book. It's also bright yellow, while the other eye is blue. The researchers did sensitivity modeling of each eye, finding that they perform different tasks. The smaller eye can only see bioluminescent light sources belonging to fish swimming at depth. Increasing its size does not make it more sensitive to flashes of light, so the eye shrank to the smallest possible size. But the silhouettes of objects swimming above the squid in time to notice his large insidious eye which is unable to distinguish bioluminescent glow at a depth of more than 200 meters can be found another representative of cephalopod mollusks it is fully transparent or glass octopus length of about 40 km eyes Optic nerves and digestive tract are the only structures visible in its glassy mantle. Not a good idea for human anatomy. A siphonophore is not a single living creature, but an entire colony of many thousands of living creatures that are united into one body. The aggregate of tiny organisms is called a senosarcoma, and each individual organism is referred to as a zood. At some point, every single one of you has contemplated the thought, what is infinity anyhow? How can you understand it? How can you imagine it? 
How can you wrap your mind around it? And how can you picture an endless sequence of numbers? A constant which never ends. A number that includes the phone numbers of all your acquaintances, the dates of birth of all the people on the planet, their credit card numbers, the designations of all known stars, and even the date of your dentist appointment. All of this massive series of numbers is contained in an amazing mathematical constant, the number pi. And despite the fact that it has been known since ancient times, to this day pi stimulates the minds not only of scientists, but also of ordinary people. Those who first calculated the number pi can be considered prehistoric people, who, when weaving baskets, noticed that in order to get the desired diameter, it was necessary to use a reed three times as long as the diameter. This fact was recorded on tablets made of baked clay that were found in Mesopotamia. Examples of accurate and not entirely accurate calculations of the number pi can be found in the works of Egyptian, Babylonian, Indian, Chinese and ancient Greek geometers. So what is this mysterious number pi anyway? It is a mathematical constant that expresses the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter. Many ancient scientists, including Archimedes, tried to calculate pi each time by filling a circle with polygons that had an enormous number of sides, so they would more tightly fit within the area of the circle. Archimedes used a 96 gun. Chinese mathematicians fit in a 192 gun, then a 3072 gun, and finally they managed to fit a polygon with a 24,576 sides into a circle. This is why many mathematicians contend that a circle is a figure with an infinite number of angles. Up until the 15th century, only nine decimal places were known. Isaac Newton calculated the number pi to 16 digits. As recently as the 19th century, it was calculated out of 707 decimal places. But with the advent of computers, this process has accelerated significantly. And now, science has already identified about 50 trillion decimal places. Pi is irrational. Its decimal representation never comes to an end, and it is not periodic. Consequently, based upon the formula that the circumference of a circle is equal to pi times its diameter, the circle doesn't come to a close, since there is no finite number. This fact can also be closely related to the spiral characteristics in our lives. After all, even the orbit of our Earth is not at all a circle. It moves in a spiral relative to the center of the universe and space-time. A logical question arises. How many numbers do you need to know in order to make a given calculation? Let's round pi up to the 15th digit. And as an example, let's take the farthest spacecraft from the Earth, Voyager 1, which is located at a distance of about 20 billion kilometers. Imagine a circle with a radius this size, in other words, a diameter of 40 billion kilometers, for which we want to calculate its circumference using formula 2 pi r. It turns out to be a little more than 125 billion kilometers. We don't need to put emphasis on the exact circumference, we are interested in the error of the measurement. So it turns out that the circumference using the constant rounded up to 15 digits is calculated with an error of less than 4 centimeters. Think about that. We have a circumference of 125 billion kilometers and the margin of error is less than the length of your little finger. We can study the problem using the example of the Earth. The diameter at the equator is 12,756 kilometers. The circumference of the equator is 40,075 kilometers, which is the distance you'd have to cover if you want to travel around the world, not taking into account mountains, valleys and obstacles like buildings, parking lots, ocean waves, etc. 
How wrong is your odometer when using a rounded off value of pi? Its error is about the size of a molecule. Naturally, there are different kinds of molecules which do differ in size, but you get the idea. The size of the error is about 10,000 times less than the thickness of a strand of hair. Now, let's take the largest possible object, the visible universe. Its radius is approximately 46 billion light years. How many decimal places of pi do you need to use to calculate the circumference of the universe with an error of no more than the diameter of a hydrogen atom, the smallest atom? You need 39 places following the decimal. If you think about how huge the universe is, well, and truly larger than we could ever comprehend, and such a tiny atom of hydrogen, you will then understand that a really accurate calculation doesn't require very many decimal places of pi. There is an abundance of surprising facts about this constant. Stanislav Ulam, a Polish-American mathematician, in 1965 wrote the numbers of pi out on graph paper. He put the three in the center and moving in a counterclockwise spiral, wrote down the numbers after the decimal point. In addition, he drew circles around all the prime numbers. He was both surprised and aghast when he noticed that the circles were organized in straight lines. Then, using a special algorithm, the mathematician made a color picture based on this drawing, which is called the Ulam spiral. Seeing that pi correlates a curved object, a circle, with a straight object, the diameter, we can find it in all sorts of places. Some find the number pi in riverbeds, the length of a river, with all of its meandering bands, in relation to the straight line between its source and its delta, according to calculations, is on average pi. Models for virtually all wave-related phenomena will involve the number pi. Let's take light and sound, for example. Pi determines what colors are visible in the spectrum of a rainbow and how the note C should sound. The number pi is also observed in the process of the cells in apples acquiring a spherical form and in the brightness of the light output of a supernova. Well, perhaps the code of the universe is encrypted in this number. The reasons to explain it are quite numerous. They range starting with UFO abductions and hidden passageways in space to parallel universes and ending with more mundane factors like severe weather conditions. 
There is another interesting fact. The Bermuda Triangle's seafloor has one of the most complex topographies in the Atlantic Ocean. A massive depression with a depth reaching 8 kilometers cuts across the triangle. This in itself does not explain the lost ships, but it makes it very difficult to detect the sunken ships or planes that have fallen into the ocean. The mystery of the Bermuda Triangle may have yet another explanation. The warm sea current of the Gulf Stream runs lengthwise along the east coast of the United States, very close to the area where ships have disappeared. The Gulf Stream may be the reason why so many sunken ships have never been found. Their wreckages could have been carried away by the undertow hundreds of kilometers from the place of a supposed sinking. Then what could be the primary cause of the accidents? One of the most plausible theories asserts that the numerous ships that have disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle could have become the victims of a rogue wave, or as it is also called, a killer wave, which can reach a height of 30 meters. Rogue waves are quite real and pose a considerable danger to sailors even these days. Unlike tsunamis, rogue waves are not formed as a result of natural disasters, but literally out of nowhere. These kinds of killer waves can appear even under relatively favorable weather conditions. They form because ocean waves are fundamentally unstable. A wave can begin to grow by drawing in the water of neighboring waves. It collects the energy of its neighbors, gains momentum and becomes very tall. The difficulty lies in the fact that it's not possible to predict the appearance of such waves. And those ships that did not have time to send an SOS signal may have been caught by surprise by this sort of wave. This version is the more deserving of consideration, given that the natural conditions of the Bermuda Triangle are conducive to the appearance of these waves. But the killer wave explanation is inapplicable when it comes to missing planes. There is an opinion that this area is subjected to charged particles, which are formed as a result of solar storms. If so, then these particles could cause damage to the electronic equipment of aircraft and ships. On the other hand, the Bermuda Triangle is located near the equator and should not be strongly affected by such storms. After all, as is commonly known, the influence of solar storms is mostly felt in the polar regions. Also, seismic activity on the ocean floor of the triangle can cause magnetic disturbances, which in turn affect the operation of navigation equipment. Yet another reason of the odd behavior of the ocean in the region of the Bermuda Triangle that is responsible for the disappearance of ships and aircraft may be located on the seabed and be of a tectonic nature. Geological faults and decaying seaweed result in emissions of methane and hydrogen sulfide. As a general rule, these gases dissolve in the seawater, but when the atmospheric pressure drops, they can reach the surface of the ocean. Rising methane and hydrogen sulfide result in a decrease in the density of the water, and when this happens, a ship will rapidly descend to the bottom as the density of the water becomes less than the density of the ship. In and of itself, this theory does not explain the disappearance of aircraft, but here too, tectonic processes may be the first link in a chain of future developments. Frequent underwater earthquakes not only lead to methane emissions, but also result in the formation of infrasound, which in turn refracts radio waves. This in particular can explain the malfunction of electronic equipment and the disorientation of pilots. Infrasound, by the way, is generated not only by the Earth's crust during earthquakes, it can be caused by lightning strikes and strong winds, infrasonic aerodynamic noise during storms and hurricanes in which people on ships and planes may find themselves. Infrasound is fraught with yet another threat. It can have a destructive effect on the psyche and the overall well-being of a person. In other words, finding themselves subjective to infrasound, pilots and sailors can lose their minds and commit rash acts. This in particular can explain the ships found in the Bermuda Triangle that were abandoned by their crews. It wasn't until the second half of the 20th century that technology made it possible to conduct a search in the ocean depths. And even in that instance, it's very difficult to find a submerged ship. 
The search for airplanes and ships that went missing many years ago without specific coordinates is comparable to the proverbial needle in a haystack. Human error combined with natural phenomena has been documented as the most common cause of plane crashes or shipwrecks and consequently is the most convincing explanation for the disappearances in the Bermuda Triangle. This is supported by the fact that in recent years the number of lost ships and aircraft has dropped dramatically as transportation technology has improved significantly. Or are we wrong perhaps? After all, the seas and oceans as well known guard their secrets very closely. The most exotic version of the Silurian hypothesis is the hypothesis of involution, according to which all animals descended from degraded representatives of times close to humans. Yes, it sounds insulting. But let's get back to real research. A lot of time and labor was devoted to searching for hints of climate change in distant terrestrial planets, the so-called hyperthermia, a kind of rapid temperature rise that could indicate the time of industrialization of civilization. This may suggest the presence of a sufficiently developed species. Such a leap is possible as a result of carbon emissions and so far may be the only proof that any race, 
including ours, will leave behind neither pyramids, nor skyscrapers, nor plastics or foam, nor Shakespeare's work, nor Beethoven's music will indicate our presence in the past, if we are talking about hundreds of thousands or even millions years. In the end, we are recognized only by the change in the breed, which marked the beginning of the so-called Anthropocene. These are terms used by many researchers to denote the current geological epoch, when human activity has a major impact on the climate and the environment. Although the Anthropocene has not yet been officially classified as a separate geological epoch, it is already clear that people have a significant influence on the geological record of our planet, shaping it today. We are already a geophysical force, and our presence is recorded in the isotopes of carbon, oxygen and nitrogen, in the extinctions of various sediments, emissions of heavy metals and synthetic chemicals. For example, the burning of fossil fuels by humans already has an impact on geological data, despite the fact that industrialization began only about 300 years ago. Well, with a big stretch, this can be considered at least some kind of plus. We managed to leave our mark, ladies and gentlemen. Future civilizations, having reached a certain level of development, will be able to learn about our existence by exploring ancient rocks. Ida, let's imagine that perhaps some other species on Earth briefly rose to at least our level of development millions of years ago. Are there any traces of them left today? For example, fossils, remains of buildings or space structures. Maybe. But it may also be that all such evidence has been erased into dust and that the only remaining traces are in very minor features of geochemistry. In addition, fossils are extremely rare and partial, so evidence can easily be overlooked, especially if a civilization existed for only a few thousand years, like ours. The truth is that modern humans have existed for a relatively short time, and life on Earth has existed for a total of three and a half billion years. That is, there was more than enough time in the history of our planet for the rise and fall of not one, but several pre-human industrial civilizations. It could be a certain race with its own technologies, vehicles, folklore and traditions in the same place and under the familiar sky. Well, about such bygone civilizations, industrial facilities built by them that existed for no more than several hundred thousand years, we have no reliable mentions and not even a single flying saucer with a mummified alien inside. We find only the most ancient structures and tools created by humans. And these finds are only a few thousand years old. In any case, in a few million years, when plate tectonics starts working, Everything on the surface, including the earth itself, will be at the bottom of the seas and oceans, one will turn into mountain peaks. If we talk about the age of our planet, then it is quite solid, and its solid surface, which makes up land masses, varies greatly in age in different places. Some of these land masses were formed billions of years ago. Others were formed from molten magma during the last hundred million years. Iceland, for example, began to form as a result of volcanic activity only 70 million years ago. Some small islands continue to form to this day. From a geological point of view, one of the oldest places on Earth is the Pilbara, a large region in the northwest of Australia. The local breed first began to form more than 3 billion years ago. The segments of its iron-rich stones serve as the best preserved example of the oldest rock in the world. Such ancient stones must be the source of some rather interesting fossils. And in general, many deserts can be suitable for research, where there is no tectonic activity and it is possible to find undisturbed rocks of the right age. Who knows, if you give the Silurian hypothesis the right to life, Perhaps research will go so far that with the right tests, researchers will one day be able to confidently say whether there was a person here or maybe a levitating humanoid with a big brain. 
that is, a certain civilization some millions of years ago. Questions about the planetary impact of civilization may, by the way, be important for the future exploration of other planets and our search for intelligent extraterrestrial life. Early Mars or early Venus may have been more habitable than they are now, and maybe one day we will find there the same geological deposits that indicate a civilization that once existed. And yes, it is hypothetically possible that previous civilizations of the Earth could have gone into space and left artifacts on other celestial bodies, such as the Moon or Mars. It will be easier to find obvious material evidence in these two worlds than on Earth, where erosion and tectonic activity have erased most of the cultural traces. But still, why look for alien life there, on other planets, when we could find it here, remote not for kilometers, but for years. Indeed, several unexplained temperature anomalies have been recorded in the history of the Earth, which could possibly accelerate the process of expulsion of intelligent life from the planet or its death. For example, it is believed that 55 million years ago there was a mysterious jump in temperature rise, known as the paleocentric thermal maximum. One of the most significant abrupt climate changes in geological history, lasting about 200,000 years. It manifested itself in a sharp increase in temperatures on the surface of continents and in the upper layers of the ocean, as well as in changes in the isotopic composition of atmospheric carbon and the extinction of a number of species. According to climate reconstructions, the temperature on the continents at that time increased by 8 degrees Celsius. The water temperature in the tropical zone was 20 degrees, which is one and a half degrees more than the current value. In the Arctic seas, the warming was significantly large scale, and the increase in the temperature of the surface waters of the Arctic Ocean could be up to 10 degrees Celsius. The most distinct thermal maximum was manifested in the carbon isotopic composition of carbonate deposits. During the thermal maximum, the carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere reached at least five times higher than the current value. Moreover, his great honor dissolved in the ocean water, thereby increasing its acidity. As a result, the carbonate shells of the dying plankton began to dissolve in water. The thermal maximum could have been caused by the fall of an asteroid or comet, or it could have been the eruption of a huge volcano, or it could also have been caused by the activity of an ancient civilization that rose just like us and then fell. This, by the way, may be the fate of all advanced species, ups and downs that occur as naturally as the seasons change. Such a universe is ironic, constantly creating characters whose technology leads to the very end they are trying to avoid. So, the question is, Will we be able to notice and identify traces of the existence of an early civilization using the method of archaeology and paleontology today, and how can we do this? This question is still open. One of the key issues in assessing the probability of detecting such a civilization is understanding how often an industrially developed civilization appears, given that life originated and that some species is intelligent. There is little point in searching for buildings or long-lasting information carriers, since over millions of years tectonics and weathering will destroy them. Not to mention the relative rarity of such structures on Earth. Today, for example, massive clusters of solid buildings of human civilization occupy less than 1% of the land area. That is, in fact, if a huge asteroid in the near future changes the appearance of our planet beyond recognition, including people's faces, then you will have to spend a lot of time to find at least some evidence of life in the past. And most likely, rock art in the style of here I was is unlikely to help identify our civilization. But even if not now, it is quite possible that we will disappear in a few centuries or millennia, in fact in a moment on the scale of the geological history of the planet and even more so of the universe. And then human civilization is just a small episode, similar to those that already took place in earlier geological epochs. 
And then, in tens of millions of years, the next civilization will appear. Then again, perhaps some civilization will still be able to become something more. Or maybe we are the same civilization, and we have every chance to go further, exploring and getting to know ourselves, our planet and other measures. Admittedly, for lovers of travel and adventure, descending into the bowels of the earth may seem a very boring undertaking, because most of it consists of solid rock of grey, green and red colors, it depends on the predominant chemical element in it. There are no fantastic caves with dwarves inside the earth, nor giant worms that have not plunged into the depths of continents with abandoned cities. The ultra-high temperature and gigantic pressure will never allow the enchanting underground landscape created by the imagination of Jules Verne to appear. And yet, thanks to the latest technologies, the underground world can still impress us. Well, from the ocean depressions to the ancient deposits of the earth, we will dive into the depths of our planet and reveal the secrets of what lies beneath them, using the latest data on this subject. This time we are using a decent list of methods for studying the bowels of the earth, and here are some of them. Firstly, seismic exploration involves measuring vibrations caused by earthquakes or artificially created sources. Secondly, the graviometric survey measures the distribution of gravitational forces. Thirdly, drilling involves the extraction of samples from deep wells in the earth's crust. Method 4. The polymagnetic method studies the orientation of magnetized crystals in rock layers. The fifth method is astronomical and space methods based on the study of meteorites. The sixth method allows reproducing geological processes in the form of modeling and studying them in laboratory conditions. And finally, the seventh method is a paleontological survey that studies ancient fossilized remains of animals, plants, and mollusks. An impressive list, isn't it? Therefore, we take all the equipment and hit the road. The easiest way to go deep into the bowels of the planet is to use an existing well. And there are many of them on Earth. But the deepest of them is the Kola Ultradeep Well, reaching a depth of 12,262 meters. For your information, hell has not been detected. True, although it is an impressive deep well, it is surprisingly negligible compared to the depth of the planet. After all, in total, it penetrates about a third of the thickness of the Earth's crust, and its length is only 0.2% of the total distance to the center of the Earth. What was eventually found in the Kola Ultradeep Well? To begin with, the researchers realized that they needed to update the temperature map for the bowels of the Earth, as they were faced with temperatures much higher than expected. At a depth of 5 kilometers more than 700 degrees Celsius. After another 2 kilometers, the temperature has already risen to 1200 degrees Celsius. At the 7 kilometer mark, one of the main discoveries was the boundary of the transition from granite to basalt. 
Another discovery was liquid water, which is much deeper than previously thought. One of the unexpected results was the appearance of open cracks filled with salt water, indicating that the Earth's crust is not dense, there are actually ways in it that allow liquids to flow. Even more exciting was the discovery of biological activity in rocks. At a depth of about 8 kilometers, the researchers extracted an underground layer of marine sediments. 24 species of ancient plankton, whose age exceeds 2 billion years, have been preserved in them. The shell of organic compounds preserved the microorganisms practically intact, despite the extreme values of pressure and temperature of the surrounding rock. These fossils have become one of the oldest evidences of life on Earth. Surprisingly, in fact, thousands of trillions of living organisms live in the bowels of the Earth, many of which are even unknown to science. The record depth with which the researchers took samples under the surface of the land was about 5 kilometers, under the surface of the ocean, 10 and a half kilometers. Moreover, up to 70% of all types of terrestrial microbes live underground. Among them there are several predominant ones that have been found under all continents. How these microbes spread through the bowels of the earth on all five continents is not yet clear. Perhaps they move inside the depths or penetrate from the surface through cracks in geological thresholds. The presented results indicate that even on our planet a huge mass of underground living organisms could exist without having noticeable manifestations on the surface. This means that there is not the slightest reason to exclude the existence of life on virtually any of the celestial bodies of the solar system, especially on the planets of the terrestrial group. Having considered the ancient earth creatures and creatures, we continue the rapid drilling. We have a mantle in front of us. It is a thick layer of hot solid rock between the Earth's crust and the molten iron core and consists mainly of silicates, a wide range of compounds with a common structure of silicon and oxygen. Common silicates found in the mantle include garnet and pyroxene. Another major type of rock found in the mantle is magnesium oxide. The temperature of the mantle varies greatly, from 1000 degrees Celsius at the boundary with the crust to 3700 degrees Celsius at the boundary with the core, so we are not destined to meet any plankton. Its viscosity also varies greatly. Basically, it is a solid rock, but at the boundaries of tectonic plates, mantle rocks are soft and able to move plastically for millions of years at great depth and under great pressure. The transfer of heat and material in the mantle helps shape the landscape of the Earth. Activity in the mantle drives plate tectonics, contributing to the formation of volcanoes and earthquakes. The mantle is divided into several layers. Upper mantle, transition zone, lower mantle and zone D are the area where the mantle meets the outer core. The upper mantle extends from the crust to a depth of about 410 kilometers. It is mostly solid, but its more malleable areas contribute to tectonic activity. The transition zone of the mantle is located at a depth of 410 km to 660 km below the Earth's surface, where rocks undergo radical transformations. Here they do not melt and do not disintegrate. Instead, their crystal structure undergoes important changes and rocks become much denser. Perhaps the most important aspect of the mantle transition zone is the abundance of water. Surprisingly, the crystals in the surface zone contain as much water as all the oceans on the surface of the Earth. Only here the water in the transition zone is not water in our understanding, it is not liquid and not steam. Instead, water exists in the form of hydroxide, hydrogen ion and oxygen with a negative charge, so it will not be possible to brew tea in it. By the way, the mantle has never been studied directly, but still many geologists study the mantle by analyzing xenoliths, 
which are a kind of rock enclosed inside another rock. The xenoliths that provide the most information about the mantle are diamonds. Yes, now I want to go underground a little more. In a good way, of course. Diamonds are formed in unique conditions. In the upper mantle at a depth of at least 150 kilometers below the surface. At greater depth and pressure, carbon crystallizes already in the form of graphite. And yet you may not have to dig deep. The fact is that sometimes diamonds rise to the surface during explosive volcanic eruptions, thereby forming diamond tubes through which you can wander for months, looking for a way out. With the help of them, we can look into the depth of up to 700 kilometers below the Earth's surface, into the lower mantle. Studies have shown that rocks in the deep mantle are most likely slabs of the seabed, which are about 3 billion years old. Meanwhile, we are getting to the core of the planet. The core of the Earth is a very hot and dense center of our planet. The spherical core is located at a depth of about 2,900 kilometers below the surface and has a radius of about 3,500 kilometers. The main sources of heat in the core are the decay of radioactive elements, the heat remaining after the formation of the planet, and the heat released when the liquid outer core solidifies near its boundary with the inner core. Precious metals such as gold, platinum, cobalt and other metals are also found in the core. This is very tempting, but remember that we are waiting for a very hot trip. Another key element in the Earth's core is sulfur. In fact, 90% of the sulfur on Earth is located in the core. Although we know that the core is the hottest part of our planet, its exact temperature is difficult to determine. Temperature fluctuations in the core depend on the pressure, the rotation of the Earth and the composition of the core elements. In general, the temperature ranges from about 4,400 degrees Celsius to 6,000 degrees Celsius. The inner core rotates differently than the rest of the planet. It rotates to the east, like the surface, but a little faster. It makes an additional revolution approximately every thousand years. As the entire Earth cools slowly, the inner core increases by about a millimeter each year. It grows because parts of the liquid outer core solidify or crystallize. The growth of the inner core occurs unevenly, and in parts, and it is affected by activity in the mantle. Growth is more concentrated around subduction zones, where tectonic plates slide from the lithosphere into the mantle thousands of kilometers above the core. The plates take heat from the core and cool the surrounding area, causing an increase in the number of cases of solidification. The crystallization process is very slow and constant radioactive decay in the bowels of the Earth slows it down even more. It is estimated that it will take about 91 billion years for the core to completely solidify. It is not surprising that many geologists describe the outer core as the geodynamo of the Earth. In order for a planet to have a geodynamo, it must rotate. There must be a liquid medium in its bowels, the liquid must be able to conduct electricity, and it must have an internal energy source that drives convection in the liquid. Variations in rotation, conductivity, and heat affect the geodynamo magnetic field. In fact, the Earth is the golden mean among the other planets of the solar system. It rotates steadily at a speed of 1,675 km per hour at the equator, thereby causing a convection current in a spiral. The liquid iron in the outer core is an excellent conductor of electricity and creates electric currents that drive the magnetic field. The energy that drives convection in the outer core comes as liquid iron droplets freeze on the solid inner core. During solidification, thermal energy is released. Warmer liquids rise up in a spiral, and colder solids descend under the influence of strong pressure. This is how convection occurs. Our journey has come to an end. I hope it was interesting. We take a couple of diamonds and return to the surface. 
Yes, our planet is unique for its natural wealth, diversity of flora and fauna, its vast oceans, continents and stable climate. Its bowels play an important role in the evolution of life on the planet. Knowledge of Earth sciences allows us to think globally and act locally. Find valuable resources such as water, metals, industrial minerals and energy, predict and prepare for natural disasters and study our own planet more than any other in the solar system.